So I'm here tonight with Mr. Phil Knight, and what a treat it is to be here with you. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you really. very much for having me on, and especially thanks for making Shoe Dog a pick. It's yes, shoe huge. Dog's a great it's huge. Pick. Um, okay, so what made you decide to finally put pen to paper? And well, write uh, you the story? know that uh, I got asked over the years for a lot of times to uh, to do a, a memoir, and uh, I never really had any interest and. Uh, as I describe in the book, it comes a period when, uh, you know, what's on my bucket list, and uh, I realized that uh, if I was ever going to do it, I better do it now. And there really is, in terms of the dedication, was sincere that uh, I didn't want my grandchildren to have them be told about their grandfather by somebody else. So you're telling the story. So I said, I better tell it. How long did it take? It took three years. Three hard years. Uh huh. But now you have this as a great. Yes. Glad to be done. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, terrific. Let's get right into the story. You know, more than a majority of. Uh, people who set out to start a business fail. As you know, right. the statistics are high. And then some few, some numbers succeed, but they remain small businesses. Mm -hmm. And fewer still become enterprises of significance, but literally one in maybe 50 million that get started turn out to be Nike. Hmm. What is the secret? What is the secret that made this one of the greatest brands ever to exist. Well, first of all, you're right that uh, the odds of success uh, are not high. When I graduated from business school, the stats were that 26 out of every 27 new businesses fail, and I think the odds might be worse now. Uh, you know, there's two, two elements, obviously, to what happened is I think it shows quite clearly in the book. It's a, a whole lot of hard, hard work and some good luck. H hard work and good luck in equal measure. You, you put together early in the story, early in the founding of the company, you put together this unusual group of people, mm -hmm. really unusual mm -hmm. group of people, um, starting with, I think, what must have been an amazing event for you when your coach, you somehow connected with your coach. Tell us that, that story, because he was special to you. He, he, he was and, and really still is, even though he's been deceased for, I think, 17 years. But uh, he was a very unique human being. He was, uh, first of all, in my view, the greatest track coach that ever lived, uh, that Bowman. he had, Bowerman, yeah, Bowerman. that uh, he had more sub four minute milers uh, when he retired than any other coach in the world. Uh, so, but he never wanted to be called a track coach. He says, I am a professor of competitive response. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way he treated his athletes. And uh, that he had a bit of Lombardi in him and, uh, and yet uh, he had a, a, you know, a, a soft side as well that he showed very rarely. And he meant a lot really to all his athletes, but to me maybe especially, I don't know, that I got to know him well as, a, as uh, when I was a runner there. He used me to experiment with on shoes a lot. To, to, it was safer than using them on Jim Grello, who was our best runner. That's pretty and, funny. And so that, uh, that uh, you know, if you asked to shrink, maybe this is a way for me to stay contacted with him. But uh, anyway, yes, he was very special and, and meant a lot so to you, the company. You, you, you Originally, you had this beginning shoe, the first one you were gonna try, you send it to him mm -hmm. in the hope that he might tell you it's a good shoe, give you the courage to go on and then what I really wanted, what I really answer. wanted from him was an order. <laughs> <laughs> and right. uh, so he called and said, let's have lunch. And uh, we had lunch up in Portland when he was up there with his team for a track meet. And uh, so I thought that was a good sign. And so I had my order pad with me. And he said, how about letting your old coach be a, a partner with you? And uh, I was stunned. And, uh, but before I could finish my hamburger, I said, by all means. Mm. So you had yourself a partner. So I had a partner. That's but you had right. an interesting way. I had, to... had more partners than inventory. He <laughs> <laughs> had an interesting way to approach the partnership because he didn't want a 50-50 partnership. You yeah, he, he, he wanted uh, me to have uh, operating control, absolutely. Mm. So that was, that was a good thing. Mm. So he's the first one on the team. Mm -hmm. Who's next up? Uh, basically, uh, another odd character named Jeff Johnson. Who, really uh, odd character. Uh, yes, very much so. And, and is odd to this day, living as a hermit. Uh, he makes J.D. Solinger look social. <laughs> that, uh, but he lives uh, not far from where J.D. Solinger lives, uh, in the, uh, uh, near Vermont uh, in, uh, in uh, western New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So, you have Bowerman is kind of your uh, technological innovator and mm -hmm. gives you the credibility, and Johnson is the ultimate salesman in a way? He basically, more than anything else, he believed in running. 
more than anything in his whole life and and runners and running and running equipment and uh, he was just totally into it so yes that made him a great salesman but I don't know if he'd have been a great salesman with encyclopedias which I had failed at earlier or or insurance if you will but he was a great shoe salesman do you think that's important to Absolutely. be passionate about the product I think it's everything yeah yeah I, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs would share that yeah. view. So who joins next? And then uh, basically next came Waddell. Mm -hmm. That uh, that uh, Bill Barman called me that uh, Bob Waddell was an outstanding long jumper on his team who had broken his back in a freak accident and would be confined to a wheelchair the rest of his life. And Barman said, you know, he's thinking about being a track coach. I don't think that's going to work. How about giving him a job? And so I met him for lunch and was taken with him, and he became kind of the, the great administrator of the group. Mm -hmm. right. And then I think one last member. No, of the that two others: team, Del two Hayes, others, right. the accountant oh, that right. I'd worked with at Price Waterhouse, who became probably the best shoe manufacturing guy in the world, and uh, and then Rob Strasser, who was really kind of the uh, distinguished himself as a lawyer in our uh, early uh, lawsuit problems, and then was really uh, an outstanding marketing guy as well. So this incredible team is right. at the core right. of this adventure that you're going to be on. But let, let, let me interrupt to say, I don't know if they were geniuses or near geniuses, but they had all the emotional baggage of genius. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, did that, what did that end up creating for you, that emotional baggage? Well, it, it became a very odd environment, but it was one that uh, basically the, thri the five of us thrived in. And, and because we were also, we were kind of misfits in a lot of ways, but we bonded together uh, and uh, maybe because and uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. What what was that glue? Is it was it the passion for running? Was it a certain it, it was approach certainly was to the, life? The, the belief in the product and the belief of where the company could go, but more than anything it was a belief in each other. If you were talking to a young entrepreneur today, what would you say about how a great team gets put together, about the role of a CEO in uh, supporting, shaping, interacting with that team. Yeah, I mean, it's life and death. I think even today, as big as Nike is with over 60,000 employees, the key key thing is people. So when you're starting out, obviously, getting the right people, is that's life and death. And, and then not only the right people, but getting them to work together and, and work for a common purpose. I've always said two nines working together will beat two tens working apart any day. And mm. how do you do that? Well, and pick the right people is number one, and then uh, giving them the environment and, uh, and maybe a little bit of leadership that allows them to keep doing that. Mm. And the environment for good, uh, for the ability to get different people to work together, I'm looking for sort of how you would articulate what is that, what is that thing you put in the environment? Well, now you're getting into, into management, and there's all kinds of different management styles that... Uh, but, uh, and, and you have to kind of recognize that each person is an individual. So there's, uh, but I always liked uh, Sparky Anderson, the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. He says, do you t treat all players the same? Hell no. He says, if Johnny Bench wants a day off, he gets it off. If a rookie wants a day off, I said, get your ass out on the field. And I think that's a good management principle by itself. I think you learned that from your coach. <laughs> and he was right? very much that way, yeah, like, absolutely. I was the one that was getting out on the field without a day off. Uh, okay, uh, the hard work part. Um, for everybody watching this, I think it would be great if you would just encapsulate the story of how you first hooked up with the Japanese company that got you started in the shoe business and a bit about those early interactions and almost losing them. Just tell us that story. Well, first of all, I had the theory that I'd written the paper for at uh, Stanford Business School uh, that uh, Japanese track shoes should uh, be able to, uh, to compete in the international market, which was being dominated by German shoes, which why would you make them in Germany? And uh, so I went, when I went to Japan, I went in the sporting goods store, then uh, the Anitsuka company had made a shoe called, uh, the brand called Tiger, which seemed to have the most promise. So I called them up and uh, they said, come on out. And uh, it was, uh, and here I was uh, 24 years old uh, and uh, real shy. And I got to go sell them on uh, exporting some shoes to me. And uh, so I wa they walked through the accounting department before you get to the conference room. And there were 20 Japanese people in the accounting department, and they all stood up and bowed. And I thought, oh boy, they think I'm a big shot. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I had my own, I had my one suit and tie on. 
And, but I went in there and, and when we started talking shoes, I got real interested because they were passionate about shoes. We were, and they had thought about selling shoes in the United States but hadn't done so yet. But they'd had some samples that showed some promise and that's when I uh, put in an order for a dozen pair of samples which ultimately some of them found their way to Bowerman. You had to make up a name for your company. Oh yeah, they they said, said, what you company do you represent? Uh, Blue Ribbon Sports. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Okay, so you're home now. Huh? You've got this deal with them. They've given you the rights to sell in a certain part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then you get a call one day that maybe those rights are going to be revoked. Yeah. Right. They, well, ultimately they did. That uh, yes, that uh, we we ultimately um, um, uh, got rights for the whole U.S. and and got the sales up to uh, two million dollars. But uh, when they got that high, they got we got noticed by got noticed by a lot of distributors. Uh, and the, the uh, sales system was different than it is now. I mean, there's no such thing as a wholesale distributor, but in those days they were, and they're always looking for lines. And they would send uh, letters out to uh, Japan saying, if this two bits in the woods outfit can do $2 million, we can do lots more. So ultimately they said, uh, yeah, you either, uh, either sell half your 51% of your company to us, or uh, we're gonna set up the other distributors. And uh, you didn't like that. I didn't like it, but in retrospect, it was the best thing that ever happened to it, right. to us. <clears throat> because then you, you get to start the company on line. your own. Had to do our own line, yeah. Right. It's fascinating reading in the story the challenges you had to finance the company. You know, today, everything we hear about is people start new businesses, they build customers, they make no money, they have right. no idea when they're going to make any money, and private equity firms or venture capitalists will give them all the money they right, want. Right. Wasn't quite like that Nothing when you like, were doing the opposite, it, right? Just the Talk opposite. a bit about trying to raise no money. venture capital. So basically it was we were relying on banks and uh, the banks, you had to put the money up before you could import the shoes. So you were kind of a reverse leverage situation. It's the opposite of buying a house where you can live in the house before it's paid for. So the banks had to loan us the money to get the shoes in and they became apprehensive about their collateral was track shoes, and what if they have to collect? They're going to pile them up in the lobby of the bank. And so it was difficult getting financing, and it was very important that we make profit every year, and so they would uh, give us a little more loan each year, which they did. And, um, and that was the process. And, uh, and we pushed the envelope pretty hard since we got kicked out of two banks uh, for being too aggressive. And, uh, but ultimately, a Japanese trading company, Nisho Iwai, uh, were, they were not bound by really kind of uh, the same rules that U.S. banks were. They could uh, charge more interest, and that was fine with us. We were interested in volume. And so we got hooked up with them, and that uh, really allowed us to grow fast. And did it ever, did you have nights when you went to bed and said, man, I've taken on this mountain of debt. I've now got to feed this mountain of debt. Did it ever worry you enough that you lost sleep? Was there ever a night I didn't? <laughs> sure, that... it was. It was a concern, but it was also, it was kind of like almost a, a constant high, because every day you went to work, you knew it mattered, right. and and it's the same with those other four people. They were they were bent the same way, and uh, we Even knew we knew. Yeah, pardon me. Even your CFO. Even the CFO, and and we would go for these offsite meetings because every every six months the business would change a lot. We were growing fast from a low base. And so we'd have to adjust to our plans. You'd have a year plan. And it was you, something was going better and something was going worse in the course of six months. So we would work hard for an hour on how we were going to take over the become number one in the United States. And the next hour we'd work hard on how we we're going to meet payroll on Monday morning. And uh, in retrospect, though, as I point out in the book, that was a very very healthy process. And because uh, basically when you got through about five years of this process, as one of the as a professor from Harvard Business School said. It's very, very unique to have one person in the room that thinks tactically and strategically at the same time. He says, you got eight guys in there think that way. So it was a special team. So it worked, and it was a special team. With, and with, I, that was one of the reasons. I wanted, you know, people in the sneaker business know Phil Knight. They don't know those other four people, and they should. Um, how do you think, let's take a fellow like Johnson. Yeah. How would he feel reading the way you describe him? Because he's quite an unusual character, as you describe him. Would he recognize that? character with the he, long he, letters I, and the endless ideas. He's read it, ideas. and uh, his reaction is, that isn't accurate at all, but it's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you, you wonder what would happen. Where was the moment that you sort of looked yourself in the mirror and you said, wow, we truly do have a tiger by the tail, and we have something that we can just take to the moon? 
Well, I think, and that's why I end the book uh, going public. I think that was the moment, and as I, I think I use a sentence in there, that's the moment when we realized the only thing standing between success and us is ourselves. That the obstacles were really cleared aside when we went pub public and had the, the trading company alongside. That uh, now there was really n nothing to stop us, and, and it was only our own management that could stop us. Right. And and that sense you get reading this that optimism is a critical ingredient to long-term entrepreneurial success. Do you still feel that way? Belief. Belief. You gotta have belief. You have mm -hmm. to have belief. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you were talking to, and I'm sure you do on a regular basis, talk to young mm -hmm. aspiring entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you say, look, there's two or three things, four things that are absolutely critical to understand if you want to succeed what would they be? Well, I, I just basically limit it to two. There's two. The most important thing is you have to, there's two sides, it's really sort of the intellectual or mental side. You have to pick a business that has a niche. You have to have a reason to succeed. You have to be something like we were doing, say, Japan can beat Germany in manufacturing of this type of a product. That was the niche, really. And then on that, you just have to have a total and complete passion because there's gonna be so many dark moments, uh, you know, I think it, the dark moments are true for any uh, entrepreneur or any uh, startup company. I'm sure that you talk to Steve Jobs and Apple, you'd see uh, many, many dark, dark moments. Ours happen to last a little longer than most of them, but you really emotionally have to be prepared for those dark moments. Mm. I think uh, every entrepreneur I've ever spoken to would, would echo that. Yeah. That there yeah, are that, dark moments that's, that's when everything's a, on the line. That's the life of an entrepreneur. And so you're gonna be into it, you better be prepared for that. In your mind, are entrepreneurs born or can they be made? I think a little of both. That, uh, that I know that for me personally, when I took the entrepreneurship class, the professor said the first day, he says, we have conferences here for all types of business people. He says, we have middle management from big companies and we have entrepreneurs. He says, the big companies, the uh, middle managers, so when they go break for lunch, they all go off together and talk and socialize and talk about their business. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs go to lunch, they all go off by themselves. But that's me. <laughs> to, do, to do that, that yeah. kind of thinking. Um, you look at the, the, the world today, um, particularly the United States, it's a bit worrisome because there's so much talk about uh, big business is bad and mm. uh, people who make money are bad and trade, global trade is bad and there's just a, a, a sense of piling on, in, in a sense, mm -hmm. against those, particularly those who've created great enterprises mm -hmm. or large enterprises. Um, if you could share something that you would like people to understand that might uh, broaden their perspective, what would you say? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I'm, I'm sad to say I agree with you on, on kind of what's going on in the United States, uh, and I don't think it's healthy. I, I do think, uh, but I think uh, particularly uh, the view, the current popular view about international trade is completely wrong and if taken to an extreme, uh, or I suppose long enough to its logical ends, it would uh, be very, very detrimental to the economy in the United States and the economy of the world. The flip side is that, uh, as, they, as, as they say in statistics, everything has a cycle, even the sex life of a flea. And, and I, I choose to think this is, uh, you know, just a cycle. It's a downward cycle when uh, businesses look down on and uh, uh, people are angry. But I don't think it's a long-term trend. I think it's a cycle and we'll come out of it. And I do think the kids coming out of university in general and the business schools in particular are more able than they've ever been. The venture capital companies are there. And I think uh, down the road we'll see a rebound in that type of thinking. Mm. Do you think the good guys or the good guys, good men and women, I use the term, uh, but I would say both, sure. uh, that have been very successful um, and have a balanced view, have a role to play in, in some way, individually, collectively, uh, coming and providing alternative perspective to what seems to be well, sure. permeating? Sure. That, I mean, in some ways that's their obligation, including, I suppose, my own. But, uh, and, and a lot of them do speak out and we do try to speak out, and, but hopefully our voices will be heard more uh, going down the road. But the, you gotta get through the media filter. Right. 
and the media in the United States, particularly now, is sort of more interested in the soundbite that uh, that they don't give you to give the rational response to. Well, this this book is a fantastic uh, contribution. So we're really fortunate that you've written it. But as you note, the book takes us from the beginning, mm -hmm. fabulous, just just incredible, incredible story, up until uh, the day you went public, mm -hmm. the day the company goes public. But there's so much of the story that isn't in here. So we really want to know, is there going to be the second part? <gasps> we want the I, second I, part. I, I, uh, when, I, when I set out to, to, to write the book, that I, that was, this was going to be the one book. There was not, wasn't going to be a sequel. And on the media tour, that I get asked that question every time. So I suppose there's some appetite for that, but it's not mine yet. But I won't rule it out. Well, good, because we're, we're going to hope when you get over all the uh, angst that went into doing this, and you relax and you see it, uh, the book is truly a masterpiece. I, I have to say, I think well, it's one of very, the great kind. Uh, business books, uh, human life stories that has been written. It's so beautifully written. Um, that's the other part that struck me. It's not just an incredible story, but you are a great storyteller. So thank you. Thank well, you coming so from you, I can't tell you how much that means to me. Thank you. Listen, fabulous. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much for your okay. time.